Bismarck's dream is realized. As Britain continues to recede, Prussia rises, creating not only a new unified German state, but also a new concert of Europe in the form of the Central Powers. Standing between Bismarck and his ambition was Napoleon III's France. France was strong, but she had many enemies. Both Germany and Italy had core provinces near the Rhine and the Rhone rivers, respectively, that both sides would like to have seen returned. While Spanish Republicans were concerned by Carlos VII, the Carlist pretender to the now defunct Spanish throne, living in exile in Napoleon III's palace. All were united against a common enemy. Bismarck only needed the excuse for war. On December 17, 1869, after returning home from a performance of Rossini's William Tell, Carlos was shot in the stomach by a masked assassin who evaded Parisian police in the thick of the chaos. The wound was fatal, and the pretender would not survive the night. The assassin, Santiago Pereira, was found dead two days later, having committed suicide in an alley behind a Paris cafe. A deeper investigation revealed that Santiago may have had communist or anarchist tendencies, but in the court of public opinion, the Spanish Republic was almost certainly behind this blatant act of terrorism. For her own part, Spain went so far as to accuse France of supporting the Carlists and supplying them with arms. Bismarck, ever the opportunist, publicly portrayed himself as the honest broker trying to defuse the situation, while secretly confirming Prussia's support to Spain. In the end, it was Napoleon III who fired the first shot, declaring war on Spain on January 3rd, 1870, while Germany and Italy would respond by declaring war on France two days later. The war was a massacre for the French. Not only the German onslaught, but the rapid Italian attack on Marseille and the unexpectedly fierce Spanish counterattack on Marsan repelled the French in all directions. After an early defeat against German forces at Verdun, Napoleon III was forced to retreat and set up defenses in Paris, before harsh conditions of the German siege culminated in the Chamber of Deputies taking the Emperor and his family prisoner and declaring the creation of a new French Republic, as well as quickly making peace with General von Moltke. Although the fighting would continue for another month, with a few pockets of resistance by Breton farmers still loyal to their emperor, the war was over. The victorious leaders, Otto von Bismarck, the Count of Cavour, and Marshal President Francisco Serrano, celebrated their victory and the creation of a new German empire at the Tuileries Palace in Paris. Many in Europe were impressed. Alexander I of the Netherlands, for instance, had been thoroughly impressed by Bismarck's adroit diplomacy and the strong performance of the German military. While his father, William III, advocated a policy of neutrality between the other great powers, Alexander has pursued a hawkish imperialist stance breaking his father's alliance with Britain and joining Germany, Italy, and Spain to form the new central powers of Europe. However, not all were pleased by the rise of this new great power. Queen Victoria, in particular, condemned the German seizure of Elsass-Lothringen, claiming that the war had been fought to avenge Spain, not punish France. Although Britain would not risk war with four European nations, for the sake of her longtime rival. She would slowly start supporting Russia as a counterbalance to Germany. While the Concert of Europe of 1815 had thoroughly collapsed, Bismarck believed his new network of continental alliances could serve as a more stable substitute. However, it was not long before Britain and Russia would put the Central Powers to the test. The sleeping dragon was rudely awakened by a wind from the sea. 
when American officer Matthew Perry had forced Japan to open her ports after centuries of isolation, Japan realized her tenuous position on the world stage. Like many Eastern powers, she thought that openness with the West allowed Westerners to exploit her resources and steal her technology. So the Emperor had closed Japan's borders 300 years ago to prevent the European powers from reaching the same level as Japan. Now, the Western powers have surpassed her and threaten her independence. The Emperor Meiji, fearful of Western influence, made open war with the Shogun, who had been hosting and courting American business interests to enhance his own power. The Boshin War, one of the bloodiest civil wars Japan had seen since the Sengoku Jidai, restored the Emperor to power as head of Japan. Emperor Meiji was able to expel the Americans and crush the Shogun and the samurai who supported him. However, simply removing the Westerners from Japan may have made her safe from Western influence, but not from Western power. Meiji realized it was only through Western tools and technology that Japan could keep her autonomy and prestige. The Meiji Restoration became a period not only of increased imperial power, but also of westernization and industrialization. The first railroads were uniting the country once divided by daimyos. New ironclads took to the sea, waving the banner of the rising sun, and the samurai warrior with his katana was replaced with the mounted cuirassier with his pistol. If Japan continues her rate of modernization, the other European powers could find their colonies in Indonesia, Indochina, or even India, threatened by the new great power in the East. Following the defeat of the Ottomans, and the creation of new nation-states in the wake of the Crimean War, the Balkans had become a powder keg ready to explode. Not only were these new nation-states ready to capitalize on a weak Ottoman Empire, but the implicit support of Russia only further fueled their ambitions. The First Balkan War of 1866 saw the alliance of Serbia and Bulgaria march south against the Ottomans to seize Macedonia. However, despite initial success, both armies were defeated by the unexpectedly strong Romanian army, which crushed the Bulgarians on their march near Gallipoli, and Serbia quickly pursued a white peace once it became clear that Russia would not intervene. The Second Balkan War of 1872 and 1873, by contrast, saw more mixed success. Again, Serbia and Bulgaria laid claim to Macedonia, but again the swift response of the Romanians crushed Bulgaria's hopes of victory and forced the surrender of the Danube Delta to Romania. It was this action that convinced Alexander II to act against the Turkish alliance, crushing the besieging Ottoman forces near Belgrade and seeing the Kosovo region ceded to Serbia and the Vons region of Anatolia handed over to Russia. This unexpected Russian aggression, both in taking land and supporting its client states, ruffled the feathers of many in Europe, particularly Russia's neighbors, the German and Austro-Hungarian empires. For his part, Franz Joseph signed a defensive pact with the luckless Mahmud IV to prevent any further incursions by the Balkan alliance. Unfortunately for Franz Joseph, his support for the Ottomans drew the unwanted attention of Romania. Romania had many core provinces and Romanian minorities living in Transylvania and Banat under Austro-Hungarian control. So when Austria-Hungary allied itself with the Ottomans, the Romanian king, Karl I, announced a new alliance with the Russian Empire and Alexander II. When news reached Belgrade and Sofia that Romania had unofficially joined the Balkan alliance, they now felt more emboldened than before, now that the armies that had defeated them were now on their side. In 
In the aftermath of the Franco-Spanish War, all foreign policy of the Third French Republic was oriented towards claiming lost French honor and expanding French global presence. If France could not challenge German power in Europe, then she could throw her weight around on other continents. Some Central American and South American countries appeared weak and promising, but such a venture would provoke war with the United States. Africa continues to be an inhospitable continent, unsuitable for colonization. Thus, Asia was the only continent that might present the chance to enhance French prestige and wash away the stain of defeat. Subpaltry gains had been made in Indochina, where squabbling warlords were easily picked off one by one. Over the course of five years, France had snaked her way up the coastline to the borders of China herself. These were small gains, but a new opportunity would present itself to the north of China. The Kingdom of Joseon, a small independent kingdom on the Korean peninsula, had opened its doors to western trade and influence over the past 30 years. However, once the King of Joseon realized that western traders were also responsible for spreading Christianity, he promptly shut Joseon's borders at the behest of his Buddhist advisors. The first president of the republic, Patrice de Macmahon, at the prodding of his minister of war, the popular Georges Boulanger, sent an ultimatum to the king, open Joseon, or face war. The king responded with a bloody persecution of Joseon's Christians. Public fury was even higher than it had been in the Franco-Spanish War, and war was declared. Nonetheless, there were some serious obstacles to the French response to these atrocities. Despite their superior numbers and technology, the French had few ports and only a few troops stationed in Asia to launch a proper invasion of Joseon. Thus, the Pied Noir army of Algeria would sail through the Suez Canal with Queen Victoria's blessing to commence the attack. What France was not prepared for was the mighty fleet to expel barbarians a flotilla of Joseon ships that invaded and attacked French Indochina in the north, and even threatened Saigon. The small French garrison held out for almost a month against the Joseon onslaught in stories of valor and heroism that would later be heavily embellished in French magazines at home. Soon, however, the Pied Noir army arrived and the mighty fleet to expel barbarians was destroyed. News of French victories reached the ears of both the King of Joseon and the Emperor of Japan. If the French defeated and invaded Joseon, they might turn Joseon into another Asian colony, like what they had done in Indochina. This, the Japanese Emperor Meiji could not allow. While French ships made their way up the coast of China, the Japanese launched an unexpected invasion of Joseon, deposed the king, and propped up a puppet king from one of Joseon's noble families. When the French arrived, this new king promised to open the kingdom again, and cease the religious persecution. With their goals achieved, and not desiring war with Japan, the French army would return back to Saigon and Algiers. Public reception was mixed. Conservative religious elements of French society were satisfied that French demands had been met, but the military was livid that Joseon was not added as a new French colony. Tensions still remained high, as Boulanger garnered more and more popular support for his hard imperialist stance. Some even thought he could win the presidency if MacMahon stepped down, or perhaps even become a military dictator a new Napoleon. Such a leader could overturn the peace of Europe, but he had to prove that he could give France her victory against the Central Powers first. As Britain's superpower status is threatened, Many European politicians 
dispute over whether the German Empire or the Russian Empire will take her place. Few seem to consider the United States as viable candidates, but perhaps there is good reason as to why the American Republic has been overlooked. The American Civil War, although short, devastated the former Confederate States of America. As politicians and businessmen focused their efforts on the reconstruction of the South and the settlement of the West, American influence overseas begins to wane. In 1869, the Tammany Hall Brokers, the same brokers who had built the Suez Canal and controlled the Sultanate of Egypt, lost substantial money in poor investments in the Bank of France, which had all but collapsed following France's defeat in the Franco-Spanish War. In an effort to recover their losses, the Hall approached Republican President Ulysses S. Grant to obtain federal grants to rebuild railroad networks in the American South. By receiving special commissions from the federal government, the Hall could play a big part in the industrialization efforts and return a profit. However, Grant's Democrat and liberal Republican rivals in Congress caught wind of the Hall's ambitions and rallied the press and public opinion against Grant, accusing him of corruption and lining the pockets of New York Yankees. The scandal was too much for Grant, who would resign from office the following month, the first president in American history to do so. His vice president, John C. Fremont, was able to pick up the pieces and strive harder to fight the corruption rampant in the South, but to no avail, as the Bourbon Democrat Samuel Tilden would win the 1872 election by a slim margin. As for the American investors, Tammany Hall would find other ways to recuperate and recover enough money to stay afloat, namely by selling its foreign investments. The Rothschild banking clan in England was able to purchase the rights to the Suez Canal and, by extension, America's influence in Egypt, turning the Sultanate from a puppet of American business interests into an extension of British imperialist ambitions. Andrew Carnegie was forced to sell his monopoly on tropical wood in the Kingdom of Siam to some of his extended family and friends still living in Scotland. Similarly, since America is now too focused on rebuilding itself, the Empire of Japan has slipped quietly out of America's sphere of influence, and is now expanding and modernizing its military. The only exception to this loss of power is the Kingdom of Hawaii, where the friendly King Kamehameha welcomes American protection and wealth. Many believe that Hawaii could one day become an American state with Kamehameha as its first governor. Nonetheless, the general trend has been the rise of British influence in Africa and Asia at America's expense. This has stoked some anti-British sentiment, particularly in New York City and Boston, where there are sizable Irish populations and big commercial interests. War seems unlikely, but America is an economic rival that Britain cannot long ignore.